Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited about this uh, Facebook Live with Representative Monique Smith and some special guests because it is um, beyond time for us to discuss the scourge of gun violence in our country and in the state of Ohio. And um, as somebody who's a citizen of Ohio and a mom and, um, and who is really concerned about this issue, and I talk to other people, I find that not everybody even knows what's happening. Where are our gun laws in Ohio? Uh, what can we do about them? So, uh, so I'm really excited that Monique wanted to talk about this today and we were able to get so many great guests to uh, discuss it as well. So my name is Carolyn Kane. I'm acting as the host today. Thank you everybody. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I introduce everybody is that you are absolutely welcome to um, put all of your comments and your questions here in this Facebook Live and we will address as many as we can um, with, with all of the people here assembled. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody and we have some great discussion for you today. So uh, Representative Monique Smith has uh, been my representative. I am a resident of Westlake for the last two years and she has been on the front lines as a legislator. So thank you for being here, Representative Smith. Thank you. And um, we're also joined um, by Mimi Karen, who is another Moms Demand Action um, volunteer and the legislative lead for, for this area. And so she's also on the front lines. And we're honored to be joined um, by Bernadette Vida, who is uh, another advocate for gun violence. And we're going to um, be able to discuss some of her personal experience. So thank you so much for joining us today, Bernadette. So, um, so I'm going to hand this over to Representative Smith to, uh, to continue the discussion and, um, and I'll probably jump back in when we have some questions. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And I appreciate that you've been so involved in helping to support all the work that we're trying to do to reduce gun violence in America and to push for better gun laws. I started um, participating in Moms Demand Action events in 2015. I had my first uh, advocacy day at the State House as a volunteer, got my husband and my friends to help cover the kid duty when my children were very small in about 2017, went to the state house um, as just a, a concerned citizen and lobbied our lawmakers to ask them to please, please, please support stronger gun laws in Ohio when we were starting to see that they were already going in the other direction. Um, and fortunately, uh, because of the folks who are in power in Ohio, we continue to see gun laws being weakened, not strengthened. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how that uh, affects people personally. And, um, you know, through Moms Demand Action, I learned that, uh, for example, in domestic violence situations, the presence of a firearm will change an incident that is violent to an incident that becomes a fatality. Um, it just escalates and ends exponentially increases the likelihood that a fatality occurs when it might not have otherwise. And when I learned that as a Moms Demand Action volunteer, it hit me very hard because my childhood, um, for me and my sister and, and my mother, our childhood was re really, our, our family life for the, for the three of us was spent uh, really trying to escape uh, the violence that my mother experienced at the hands of my father. And what it made me realize is that if there had been a firearm present, maybe we would not have escaped. And that is very frightening to think about. Um, and so that's just one of the many reasons that I advocate so strongly for stronger gun laws in Ohio. Of course, when we see mass shootings, when we see excessive force used, um, such as in the case of Jalen Walker in Akron, we need to really, really, really evaluate all of our policies uh, around the use of firearms in our in our country. And I wanted to bring in my very, very dear friend and longtime friend, Bernadette Vida, who I have known since we were both participants in the AmeriCorps pro, uh, program called City Year. And um, that was right after we were both in high school. So we won't tell you how long ago that was. Yeah. But um, I feel really fortunate that we've maintained a strong friendship for years. And it was after we first met that Bernadette um, let me know and all of her friends know that a terrible tragedy had happened and she had lost her dad to uh, murder by a firearm. 
And I want Bernadette to talk about what the very real life consequences of that are and what that experience was like so that we can just have another reminder that when the news goes away after these incidents, the trauma remains. And I want Bernadette to kind of talk about what her experience was so that we can all remember that and use that to help ourselves keep going to demand better, stronger gun laws. Bernadette, will you tell us a little bit about that experience? It's so, um, you know, I, as we've spoken in the past, it's so many layers to, to trauma. There's so many layers to it. And, you know, one of the things that um, always sticks out in my mind is that when my father was first murdered, um, I reached out for a support group and no one was calling back. There was only um, other like Spanish speaking support groups in towns and I don't speak Spanish. And I reached out to so many places and no one called me back. And it took several weeks. It feels like it was at least three weeks to a month until someone called me back. And, you know, I always say that I'm someone who has the resources, but I don't mean financial. I always say that I'm, I'm a loud mouth. I asked for what I need, but I was really sinking and I needed help and I needed someone to talk to about what was going on. So, you know, the resources right away were, were not there. Um, you know, we've talked so I need for you to ask me specific questions because it's so multi-layered. And so, you know, we've talked about multi-generational, but if you can <laughs> specifically ask me. Um, yeah. Can you tell us what the incident was and how you found out about it? Sure. Um, my parents were divorced. I'm going to give you the cliff note version. Uh, my parents were divorced and um, my father was dating another woman and this woman's husband um, was not happy that she left him for my father. And it was, you know, what the media calls or people call a love triangle. And um, he shot the, the guy who shot my father was a prominent plastic surgeon in Massachusetts. And he had a license to carry actually not a light, he had some incident that happened in the past, but he was, he had the ability to carry and he shot my dad three times in a hospital room um, when they were visiting. It's, it's such a long, complicated story. So I hope this is a cliff note version. Um, he shot my dad three times, um, once in the stomach, which ruptured his aorta, once misfired and once behind the head execution style. And my father, died of course um not of course but he he died and um what led to um you know a uh, grand jury uh saying that there's enough evidence to convict this man of first degree murder to the trial um a year later a year a year and a few months later to um the judge only giving the man five years because at the end he was only convicted of voluntary manslaughter so, I mean, the, 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 the timeline, the trauma, it's not just on impact of what happened when the cops came to our house and said, your dad's been murdered. It's every aspect of it from the judicial system, the criminal, what happens with victims, my life as a young woman, my career, my body, my mind, everything everything changed. And, and so it's, when I say, ask me specific questions, because it's, it's spanned such a long time. And if I take just the physical ailments that happened to me after my dad was killed, that's a few decades. That's like a few years of stories. The emotional, that's years of stories. The financial, mm -hmm. the people talking to me about you know, just anything, dating, forget it. Like people Googling you and knowing about your life story before you've even said, hello, I like chocolate ice cream. It's like, oh, I know your life story. And you're like, okay, well, how do you continue? So it's, it's such a long span of a story. And how, and, and one thing that you and I have also talked about is how when other news events, other, other gun related tragedies happen in the news, it brings it all back up again. And can you just talk about what your experiences have been with that? I've, for years, 
after my dad was killed, every time the news, some mass shooting happened, I would, I, what I call spiral, I'd be fixated on the news. I'd have to know the victims' names. Uh, so I would pay them honor, if you will, you know, like to, to, so it wouldn't just be the victims. It would be, they were people because it's it's always the victims they were this they were that and then the media is gone and it's like my sister once said in her victim impact statement she says the media treats us like a buffet table they take what they want and they leave the rest mm -hmm. and the trauma of big events or gun conversation or anything like that the last time i spiraled was sandy hook that was the last time I sat in front of the television and said, you can't do this anymore. And that was nine years ago. And what do those traumatic, what do the sort of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms look like, feel like in your body, in your mind, emotionally? Well, it, it changes, through, it changed throughout the years. In the beginning, when I first moved to New York, I live in New York City. When I first moved here, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't I was not functioning. And a lot of people who know me, they're like, of course you were functioning. I know I wasn't functioning. I was not a functioning human. I was stressed. I even look back, my skin was blotchy and red. Um, I, you know, that throughout the years, it was therapy. It was different forms of therapy that helped me. And a lot of forms of therapy like EMDR, which is mainstream now, but back then people weren't talking about it. And I for sure wasn't like, oh, I'm in therapy twice a week. Oh, I do EMDR. Oh, I do psychodrama. Oh, I do this in order to help me just function, just mm -hmm. everyday function. So it's, it, it rips apart every cell of your body it does and as much as people are like they seem okay it catches up to people if they don't do the work you have to do the work because and when i say the work i mean like you have to process it you have to let it out i mean it's we know it through seeing veterans um james gandolfini did a great uh documentary about uh ptsd with um with soldiers and i bawled watching this because i'm not a soldier but everything those soldiers were talking about I had experienced. So it's not just what's happening right now, it's, it ripples out. It happens to our family. And then years later, I found out what that impact, how that impacted my friends and what traumas they've carried on from my, me telling them my story and being in my life. It's not just our family, it's a community, it's everyone. Mm -hmm. And the trauma, I mean, I don't suffer from PTSD anymore, but I definitely have residue. I'm so proud of you for how far you've come. Thank you. I know how much work you've done and I know that you are thriving and flourishing every day. And I know that it wasn't easy to get there. And I'm sorry that you experienced this. And I thank you for everything you've ever done to speak out about this because I know it's not easy and I just hope that it with all of us continuing to talk about it with you being brave enough to talk about it and other survivors that the people who have the most power in states like mine and in our country will make the biggest changes that we're all begging them to make. Um, so I want to use that as a transition point to bring in Mimi to talk about the really terrible gun laws in Ohio that Moms Demand Action has at, really at the top of its priority list. Um, I, of course, I am a state representative, but I really want to center the volunteers of Moms Demand Action who choose to put in their time to be sort of a watchdog organization and also an advocacy organization, but I want to say something else. You have no choice if you care about the safety and well-being of your friends and family and children. And I, I want to make sure that people understand. I'll just speak for myself. I don't like having to put on this shirt. Every time I have to put on this shirt and go to a rally, I feel sad. I feel sad when I have to get in my car and leave my kids and my family on a Saturday and go join Sherrod Brown or whoever it is, you know, who are our US senators and, and, and all of us. 
you know, once again, uh, recognizing that another terrible mass shooting has happened, like we did in 2019 with Dayton, like we do all the time now. This is not fun. We'd probably all rather be doing a lot of other things, right? But we choose to do this to keep our families safe and to make change. And so Mimi, that's why I want to center you. And I want everyone, I want to spotlight you and show everyone all the hard work that you do and how smart you are and how <laughs> Moms Demand Action trained me to understand that I needed to be watching my state legislators voting record, which is what I started doing. And then it alarmed me so much that I ran for the seat and ran against my sitting state representative. So thank you for all the work that you do. And I want to tell you, it does make a difference. And you are um, training us all in ways that should be scary to the gun industry. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you because every time I hear you speak and cheer, you know, us moms on, it, it is, it helps um, because we, you know, you know what we're up against and it is, it is an uphill battle and it is, um, it is work. It is a lot of emotion and energy and frustration. Um, and Mimi, so, I just want to yeah. say one thing on that point. There is a certain amount of turnover that happens with our gun, uh, our gun sense leaders in this state and everywhere, because this is just that we haven't even experienced it directly, many of us as Bernadette has as survivors. And yet still, this is emotionally draining work. This is, this is very deeply disturbing work. And I just, I just want to say uh, that we have to take turns and we have to pass the baton and give, give ourselves and each other the chance to have self-care and to take a breath. And with that, I'll let you go back to telling us about all your good work. Thank you. Well, it was a, truly an exhausting, I, I would say this 134th General Assembly has been brutal when it comes to gun legislation. Um, working very hard to pass bills that are, are going, that, that put us all in crazy amounts of danger. And the frustration is that not only do these bills come up, they pass and they pass with uh, Moms Demand Action volunteers in the state house, but also, you know, members of the community, members like Bernadette who has experienced gun violence and, our lawmakers are listening to the research and the science and the data and seeing graphs um, and hearing survivor stories, yet uh, turning a blind eye and um, you know, packing the state house, opposing a bill like permitless carry, hearing from um, mayors across the state, hearing from law enforcement across the state, claiming you know, to, to back the men and women in uniform, yet voting in a way that puts them in much more danger than they already have. Um, it, it's astounding and it is scary. And I just, I wanna add, um, Bernadette, thank you for talking about your story. And um, I can tell you, I mean, how I got in, in this is really, I just, maybe selfishly, I couldn't sleep anymore. It was, um, you know, after every mass shooting or, you know, living in Cleveland and hearing horrible stories, um, eventually, you know, became a member of Moms and got involved in legislative. Um, and, and boy, was that a tremendous wake up because I feel broken in the sense that we, you know, hear stories and Bernadette experiences this daily and so many people in our state do. And it's, it is so unnecessary. And, and that, that uh, I, I don't know that I, I don't know the words for what that does to me other than it, it just breaks me because um, our lawmakers know who are passing these bills and, um, you know, courting the gun lobby know what this will do yet still continue to court the gun lobby and, um, it's unbelievable. And what I think of, I do, you know, when I do hear a survivor story, I think about like Bernadette has talked about what it did to her friends. This is, you know, I, I think about, I have friends actually, I lived in Chicago and I have many friends. I have a good friend who was all over the media because he happened to be at the parade in Highland Park. It decimates a community. It's not just the person who, who lost a loved one. It's not just someone who was injured in, um, you know, 
by a, a shooting. It's, uh, it, it, these are, chill. I have a friend actually who is tonight at Highland Park High School helping to, she's a therapist. So she's counseling people who come to the high school. Uh, these are, you know, children who saw it on the news or attended camp and heard about it. You know, these aren't just people who ran from a shooter. These are people that, you know, know someone that was at the parade and that's, it, it demolishes people and forever. And it is, it is unnecessary. And so, and the, the hardest thing also is, you know, we packed the state house, but our lawmakers are not hearing what we're saying and what we want. And that, that is very concerning. And so now what we're seeing is more guns in the hands of people who shouldn't have them in Ohio. Absolutely. Um, so we know that now in Ohio, the governor has signed into law the right for people to carry concealed fire, firearms with no training and no permit. <laughs> And we know that that is such a huge divergence from the traditional position that responsible gun owners have always taken. People who are sports shooters, people who hunt, people who target shoot have always highly, highly regarded the, the um, they've highly prioritized training and safety. People who are responsible gun owners in the past, but what's happened is a radicalization of the gun industry to sell as many guns to as many people as possible of all kinds and all lethality levels. And they no longer represent the, the responsible gun owners of the past who uh, have, have been perfectly comfortable in the past with having background checks for every single person who buys a gun, having safety training, having a permit. Today's views on guns that are being pushed in states like Ohio just don't reflect responsible gun ownership. Moms Demand Action has always said that it acknowledges the right for people to own firearms and will happily train folks on how to um, store firearms safely, which is locked and separate from ammunition. We will provide that gun training. There is a, there is a program called the Be Smart program, which is just helping gun owners to understand that you might think your gun is safe when it's in your bedside table or in your glove box of your car, but we're gonna tell you that it's not because that's how so many accidents happen with children, with you know, busy hands and curious minds. We need to, we need to require and, and, and promote safety practices, but we now live in a state and in a country where the most radical gun lobbyists say that those basic things are a threat to their Second Amendment rights, which is just not accurate and which we don't believe believe in. So in Ohio, people on my side of the aisle have tried to propose things as simple as just requiring a piece of paper, a training pamphlet, a safely a safety pamphlet, maybe even a pamphlet on preventing suicide. All of these things are rejected by the super majority in power in Ohio, these basic small things that could save lives because of this radicalization of the industry. So I, I appreciate Mimi that you're keeping an eye on it. I want to talk quickly before we go tonight about um, a piece of legislation that I have proposed with my colleague, State Representative Lisa Sebecki. It's House Bill 700. And what we proposed uh, in the wake of some of the more recent mass shootings, as we just keep trying to find some kind of common sense solution that we can get some support for in Ohio. What we have proposed is acknowledging, look, guns are going to be sold in Ohio. That is what is happening here. We understand that that is not changing. And we would like to take the sales tax from the sale of firearms and ammunition and have that money directed toward prevention of gun violence, programs for prevention of gun violence and treatment for the trauma that comes from gun violence that we've heard tonight is so real. It's real for the direct survivors. It's real for people in their personal circle and it's real for entire communities. And it can become generational as Bernadette and I were talking about earlier today. You know, generational trauma is real and it manifests itself in physical symptoms, in psychological symptoms. And those are the things that keep these cycles going. So I'm gonna just put out a call to any of my colleagues who are watching this to please support House Bill 700. 
where we could use some of the funds that come from the sales of firearms um, that will probably increase under the laws that our Republican supermajority are passing in Ohio. And let's at least put that money into prevention and treatment of gun, viol uh, gun violence and trauma. Um, so I, I want to use that as a jumping off point. I want to answer any questions um, that folks might have if there's anyone um, in the audience who has questions to put in the chat. Um, Carolyn, I know that it's a beautiful summer night. We probably don't wanna go on for too, too long, but I wanted to just have a moment for all of us to gather together and make sure that we uh, don't look away as they say in Moms Demand Action. We keep the focus on this issue and on this legislation and on all of the lawmakers who have the power to make changes. And we still have an opportunity to do that this year. The year is not over. The General Assembly, the, bi the biennium is not over. We still have opportunities when we come back from summer break to do good things this fall. And as a state, we can choose to keep making our gun laws worse, or we can, we can turn a corner, we can turn the page, we can pivot, we can, we can make some changes. Carolyn, um, do, you, do you see anything that any, anyone has, has wants to bring up or that we haven't covered? We do have some questions, but um, just in listening to both of you talk and, you know, I, I tried to tune in a little bit more to what was happening in the legislature this year too, because it, it's so disturbing what what's happening there. And um, what I was seeing was that for things like loosening the gun uh, regulations, whether it was permitless carry or the arming teachers um, and removing those uh, regulations there, there seemed to be a lot more testimony to oppose the loosening of those regulations than there were to uh, in favor of. So it seems like that is, is not the will of what Ohioans really want. Um, is that what you're seeing out in there in the field? You know, when I knock on doors and talk to voters, there is uh, almost unanimous support for basic common sense gun safety legislation and for improving our laws and strengthening them. Um, people don't want to harden our schools and arm teachers. People want us to have safer requirements for gun ownership and Make sure that people, you know, are of an appropriate age to even consider purchasing a firearm, that they're trained, that they have a permit. Um, those are just basic common sense things. Uh, and I, 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 I don't I don't talk to any voters in my, you know, suburban cities in either my old house district 16 or my new house district 16, as the maps have changed this year. I don't find anyone who has any problem with those concepts. And in fact, the light bulb really went off for me. I say this all the time when my own father-in-law, before he passed away, who had been a card carrying member of the NRA and a lifelong hunter said to me, why don't we just have universal background checks? And then I realized that he's not being represented by the gun industry or even by the NRA anymore. So um, I think I think that you're right, that there is a strong amount of interest in this. There's, there's a lot of heartbreak out there, a lot of frustration, a a lot of disappointment and people want change. So we do have some questions and I, I want to get to those before we go ahead and let everybody go on with their, uh, with their evening. Um, so Liz here on Facebook, um, you mentioned the related uh, that the bill where um, you've been discussing taking the tax revenue from gun sales um, in order to help support victims of gun violence. And she's wondering, um, how much money that you think we could potentially raise from that in order to you know support mental health and support victims of gun violence so we have estimated that if we take um the sales tax revenue from both firearm sales and ammunition sales in ohio we can raise anywhere from 24 and a half million to 38 million dollars that can be directed into trauma related and gun violence prevention related programs we can we have an infrastructure infrastructure that can facilitate that through what we call our adams boards our our boards of uh, mental health and addiction services in counties throughout ohio um, and so there is a huge amount of opportunity there to both prevent and treat the impact of uh, firearm 
uh, uh, accidents and violence. And so I guess um, my question would be um, maybe for Bernadette. Bernadette, how would you see uh, gun laws that take that kind of attack in terms of supporting the victims um, of gun violence and maybe even preventing some of this through some, some more mental health um, resources, how would you see that impacting um, people like yourself that have been through this kind of a trauma? Mm, I mean, I wouldn't have had to essentially call a million places in the beginning and look for resources for myself and my family um, you know, in the beginning. And now, you know, there are so many more groups and so many more organizations since my father was killed. And I've been an advocate and doing this for, well, since I was 14, but for other reasons, but it's, um, you know, Monique, what you're doing, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant, not because you're my friend, but it's, a, it's, it's, it makes so much sense. And I, I you know, I, I, one of the things that I've always said it's not gun control and it, no, we didn't say that it's it's common sense. Well, what does common sense mean? What does gun safety mean? What do all these things mean? And it's really just common sense. Like if you're getting your license, you need to sit in the car with someone and I don't know how many hours, but you have to sit and put a seatbelt on and seatbelts weren't legal. It's like all these common sense things that just save lives. And it's just not common. And I, I hate to say this, but I've always said, and you know, Mimi, you said that, you know, you weren't affected, but then you were part of it and you were listening and then you had friends in Highland. And it's like, I hate saying this. And I say this all the time, but it's going to eventually hit home, like home, home to everyone. everyone. And if you don't get that, it's like, it's like our health. It's like the doctor says, hey, you have high cholesterol. Are you going home and eating steaks every night? No, you're going to stop. You're going to like take care of your vessel. And we're not taking care of our vessel, which is our country, our schools, our everything. Everyone's like, just give them a gun. Just give them this. Just, you know, it's, it's just, it's so, it's such a big thing to even talk about. And it's so, I'm so in, in it. Um, and I know you all are so in it as well, but it's not just helping the survivors but I know this sounds so cheesy, but saying hello to people and just recognizing them and seeing them and saying hello. I mean, I saw this guy on CNN the other day. He said he would have, he would, he was a uh, almost a school shooter. And he talked about what stopped him. And there's a Ted talk on it. And it's just, sometimes it's connecting with people that we just kind of look down on, like on the streets, people kind of poo poo on someone, but it's really, I think connecting all those things, all of that goes to, you know, mental health care and us understanding how to care for ourselves and care for each other. And I know that there is a program that was created by the Sandy Hook Promise Organization that came after that terrible massacre. And, and the name of the program is called Start With Hello. And they roll it out to school children so that, so that we can stay connected to each other and emotionally connected and checking in on each other. And that is, there are so many things that we are trying to do and that we could do better. And I think that having some more funding will help. Um, uh, in addition, oh yes. Can I just say one thing? I don't have kids, but I have a niece. And this is so, this is what trauma does. I said to her, and it makes me so emotional. I said, be nice to everyone in school because I fear for her. Right, right. And, and that's my trauma. You know, that's my trauma. Right. Sorry, and, I didn't think I would cry, but. And she, no. and, and Sorry. I know she knows how much you care about her when you say that. We shouldn't have to even consider that it's. No, but I, I just said, be nice to everyone. And because we're all so immigrants. So I said, you know, I'm an immigrant and she knows that no one liked me as a kid. So I'm like, be nice to the immigrants too. Be nice to everyone because not just because the gun shooting, but just like, it's like, I can't even believe I have to think of that for her, but that's the generational trauma that I'm unfortunately share with her. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but. 
I, I well, do what I can. And lawmakers, you know, that we have a lawmaker in Ohio. His name is Niraj Antani. And he actually said that we all cry crocodile tears over these issues. Can you imagine something more callous what, and horrible what's his, to say? What's his name? Let me call him. <laughs> he's a he's a state senator and I, I just want lawmakers to know how real it is every day when we clutch our children before we put them on the school bus or let them walk out the door how we kiss them extra times and hug them extra tightly those are real things I feel afraid I feel afraid and I don't want my kids to hear that I'm in my house and I'm tired of us feeling afraid and we don't have to live like this um, I wanted to also talk about one other bill that we know works in states where it's implemented. It's a red flag law. And a red flag law is something that I have proposed here in Ohio, along with my colleague, Allison Russo. And what that does is it says, if someone makes an explicit threat to harm himself or others, there is a process by which this person can go in front of a judge and a judge can decide whether there should be a cooling off period where this person has firearms temporarily seized from their possession so that no one is actually harmed. And this is this is something that you know allows a, a fair process for the person who's involved, but it is shown to prevent gun violence in states like Connecticut, in states like Indiana, in states where it's been implemented. If it had been available in Florida before the Parkland shooting, that, that young man was telling everybody, there were so many red flags, there were so many signs. People knew that this young man was a high risk you know, was a threat to himself or the community. But the problem is if we don't implement red flag laws, which are also called extreme risk protection orders, then law enforcement doesn't have any choice but to wait until a tragedy happens. They can't intervene before a crime happens, before a tragedy happens without ERPOs, extreme risk protection orders, or red flag laws. So those are two pieces of legislation that I've support, supported. We also have um, a gun safety caucus, gun violence prevention caucus. All of the lawmakers in Ohio who are in that caucus are all trying to work together to amplify what we know is the majority view that we should be implementing common sense gun safety measures. And so I just wanna thank you for helping to keep the conversation going. Um, and Can I just, just appreciate you all so much. Um, no, I just want to add that what you're talking about, these bills, um, you know, they're backed by research. You're not just making up, uh, I heard this worked in, you know, Utah. Mm -hmm. This is, um, there, there's, this is all research-based. Mm -hmm. And we actually, can document um, that gun violence is reduced when these laws right. are implemented. And it's not, uh, it has nothing to do with uh, Second Amendment rights. That's right. Um, and, and Florida now does have red flag and Ohio doesn't. So we can do right. this. We can do it. Thank you, all of you. I appreciate you all so much. Um, Mimi, if people want to get involved with Moms Demand Action, what's a good way to do that? Um, text READY to 64433. The word READY. 64433. Right. And Mimi, does a person have to be a mom to be involved with Moms Demand Action? Mothers and others. Just care about gun violence. Mm -hmm. It was started by a mom. It's very much mom led, but for sure, we know that in the Cleveland area, for sure, one of our best regular volunteers is, is one of the guys in our community, Louie. Um, and so uh, we uh, need everyone's help. We need everyone to stay engaged and involved. There are opportunities to provide training and education and visibility and appear at community events just by having an information table. So many ways to get involved and we need to stay involved no matter how hard it is. So thank you for being part of that tonight. Thank you all of you for, for joining us because um, this has been a great discussion, I think. And um, I want to also add um, that, you know, here in Ohio, the people that are, that are passing the laws um, in the House of Representatives, uh, in the Ohio House of Representatives are all up for election this year. So, um, so it, if you look up, if you're elsewhere in Ohio and you look up your rep, I'm lucky I have rep Smith as my rep, but if you're elsewhere in Ohio and you look up your rep and you see that they are voting for, you know, loosening of gun legislation regulations and they're voting against any of these common sense measures, definitely get out there and support their opponent. We want need people in here who are going to vote for common sense gun laws to keep us all safe, keep our kids safe in schools, but all of us everywhere. 
So thank yeah. you everybody. Carolyn, really we... quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm adding one more thing. I am proud to be endorsed by Moms Demand Action. Um, there are two designations. There's a gun sense candidate designation, and then there's an actual endorsed designation. I have the higher designation, the endorsed designation, which I'm very proud of. And I'm also the only candidate in my primary elect uh, race that I'm in right now. Um, voting is August 2nd. I'm the only candidate who is endorsed by every town for gun safety. So really proud of that. And I just want to underline what Carolyn just said. What you can do right now, of course, as Mimi said, we can all go and advocate at the state house when there is an immediate need to speak out on a bill. But we, what we can do all the time is help candidates who are running against gun extremists. We can help them. They need help. They need help knocking on doors, making phone calls, writing postcards. They need donations. Sometimes those gun extremists are very well funded. Uh, you can run yourself. You can run yourself. And so if now is not the time for you to do it, start thinking about it, start getting engaged, start getting informed, and uh, let's all make a difference together. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. And everybody have a great night. Thank you. Good night.